kids, it's Mr. McFly here, hope you're well. Now it's almost time for me to send this bad boy, the Triumph Bonneville Bobber, back to those nice people at the Triumph factory. I've been riding it for the last few weeks and I think I've uh, had a good chance to get to know what the bike is actually like to live with. So in this review, uh, I'm going to take you through some of those things that you don't necessarily get if you just go out for an hour's test ride on one of these bikes. I'm going to be looking at things like what's it like to ride on different sorts of roads, what's it like at night, what's it like to clean, all that sort of thing. So stick around and stay tuned for the next couple of minutes and I'll tell you what it's like to live with the Triumph Bonneville Bobber. So what's the bobber like for riding in town? Well, the low seating position gives you bags of confidence. So, uh, you know, if you have to stop in traffic and stuff, just get your feet down, no issue at all. The good thing about the uh, bobber is the widest part of the bike is, of course, these handlebars and these mirrors. So they act as uh, excellent sort of whiskers so you know what you can filter through. And the bike is quite narrow. And because of the throat of the exhaust sound, hopefully people can hear you coming when you're in the urban environment. So I think it's a little around town type bike. Not this little, there I go again. The bobber is pretty good. It's got these pretty wide handlebars, so uh, it's really easy to nip through gaps and stuff. Like this one, for example. And the turning circle seems pretty good as well, so uh, again, you're unlikely to get stuck in a little spot that you can't get out of. Which is a real plus if you're in a lot of traffic. And given this uh, twin is such a big old lump at 1200cc, she doesn't seem to mind going slowly. There's none of that sort of uh, judder and stuff. Where's he going? Come on then, she right there. Come on then. There's none of that judder and stuff that you sometimes uh, associate with big old lumps at low RPM. So in summary then, around town I would say, just like everywhere else, the bobber is a pleasure to ride around town. So riding at night time on the bobber then. Well, these cameras never really give you the uh, full extent of uh, light spread on motorcycles. So it's difficult for you to see. But on full beam as I am now, I've got a great view. On dip, on this particular bike, the uh, dipped light is actually adjusted so it's just about in front of me, about uh, 20 yards, so I can't see far enough ahead. But I don't think that's a problem with, um, with the lighting per se, that's just an adjustment issue. If I go back to full beam, I can see absolutely fine. It seems uh, a very bright light, uh, and I guess the headlight is uh, LED, and I imagine it's the same light as uh, was in the T100 that I rode a while back, which was a brilliant light and was adjusted slightly higher than this and it's sort of like turning night into day. So I don't think there's any issue with the lighting on this. At night time, nothing's lit up, the uh, controls aren't lit, so you're gonna have to remember where they are, which is a bit of a nuisance that uh, motorcycles don't have lit con um, you know, controls. But on this particular bike, there's not a lot of controls, so it's uh, not gonna be a problem. You'll soon learn where everything is. It'd just be one of those nice to haves to have lit up buttons. The control itself, uh, turning the light from full, which I'm on now, to dip, uh, is just one button. Again, it's the same as on the T100. You literally press it once for full, you press it again, you're back to dip. Press it again, you're back to full. Press it again, you're back to dip. So it's um, very, very straightforward. The only thing that uh, you lose with that functionality is, of course, you can't flash somebody like you would. On a lot of bikes, you can just sort of, you know, squeeze the button once and you'll flash them. With this one, if you squeeze them, you'll just put it into the other mode. So if you want to try and flash someone, you just got to sort of do it quick in this sort of manner. So it is sort of possible. I can't come in, so I'm going to have to go to dip, which is going to be horrible. There we go. I don't know if the camera's picking up, but I cannot see very far ahead on dip. Full beam, no problem. Luckily, I know this road pretty well. If you're somewhere you didn't know, it might be a bit of a problem. So the fuel light on the bobber comes on when you've got two bars left on the main fuel gauge there. It's 
quite a small tank so uh, I think uh, stopping at fuel stations is going to be quite a familiar thing if you're a bobber owner but let's go and find a fuel station and see uh, see what she's like on the forecourt right stand has got this massive bit out the side which makes it nice and easy and then the key is down here which is very odd it's a bit of a faff of used to conventional placement okay and the fuel cap looks to be one of these lockable twisty things I think this is like they have on the T100 where it actually twists yeah it twists all the way off there we go I'll actually get off the bike this time somebody mentioned that uh, it was bad form to he sat on the bike while he filled it up and I completely get that if you had a petrol spillage on the hot engine you need to be able to get out the way quick right that seems to be about as much as I can squeeze in and that's put in 6.64 litres so <laughs> barely anything in other words very strange this fuel cap spins on and then it's locked looks cool though great stuff clean that off the nice paintwork okay right Let's get the show back on the road then massive stand right and it's uh, still showing a range of 26 miles and no indication on the uh, fuel gauge yet as it turns out quite a few tramps do it takes a while for them to recognise that you've put fuel in it seems right let's see what it thinks the range is going to be once it works out that we're moving again okay it's starting to build up now okay it's gone to uh, it's gone to full tank now and it's starting to work out how much uh, how many miles we can do. It's clicked up to 72 at the moment, that might settle down to something else, but uh, quite a small tank, so I think uh, filling up is going to be a regular feature for the uh, bobber owner. But no problem at all, I mean, it's, uh, you know, this uh, is not fiddly at all, the fuel cap, and uh, once you get used to where the key goes, the side of the bike, then uh, no problem at all, like all these things, just getting used to it. Okay, what about uh, some of the sort of general day-to-day -day maintenance things that you have to do on the bike? Checking the tyres on this. Um, this one just has normal Schrader type valves. They're not the um, angled type, which is a bit of a shame because the angled ones just make it easier to get at. But on the front wheel, no issue. You can just get your, your checker in there, no problem at all, because you, you're not encumbered by a disc. So that's one advantage of just having the single disc. Um, you can certainly check the front tyre. Back one, not quite so straightforward. So the back tyre uh, valve is uh, right under here amongst the spokes and all the guards. So although you can, uh, you know, you can get at it quite easily, uh, it's a bit more of a faff to actually check. It would have been handy if they put one of those sideways ones on because I have real trouble with my particular tyre gauge getting that in there. It can be done. There we go. But it's a bit of a faff, it has to be said. An angled, an angled valve would have been nice. Well, of course, I can't tell you what it's like to uh, ride the bobble with a pillion because this is very much a one-person bike. No option for a rear seat you're going to be riding this on your own which is such a shame because uh, it really is an enjoyable ride and uh, something that would be great to share but uh, pillions will just have to take our word for it it's a great bike so on to one of my favorite subjects then, and that's washing the bike what's the bobber like to uh, wash well I have to say this bike has got an awful lot of nooks and crannies not only has it got the spokes to deal with but it's also got a lot of this sort of uh, bar work scaffolding and what have you uh, to get your hands into so it is quite a difficult bike to wash it has to be said but uh, she does come up quite nicely once she's done um, and drying wise uh, yeah you can do the tank and stuff with the cloth that's fine but really to get into all those nooks and crannies you're gonna need uh, an airline or one of those um, bike dryers just to just to get it done but worth putting the effort in because she looks great once she's done What about manhandling the bike? Uh, what's she like to move around? Well, as you can see, she's got a pretty low seat, so uh, you have to kind of stoop down quite a long way to reach her. Uh, but actually, because the center of gravity is pretty low, all the weight is low down, it's actually quite easy to move around. You don't feel like it's gonna uh, drop at any point. So as far as on the driveway or in the garage, not a problem to move the bobber around. 
So what about fuel economy on the little bobber then? Well, I say little bobber, it's, it's a 1200cc bike, forgive me, it feels little because it's uh, low down. Fuel economy, the bike tells me it's doing 54.4 miles per gallon, and I've no reason to disbelieve it, I've not actually worked out the figures. What I do know is, I seem to be going to the fuel station an awful lot, so it might be quite frugal for a 1200, but goodness me, you and I are going to be out, um, getting to know your fuel station attendant well. And then the only other thing from a general maintenance point of view is no centre stand on the bike. So when it comes to lubing the chain, you're going to be you're going to have to find a way to either raise the back end of the bike somehow so you can spin the wheel, or you're going to have to manhandle the bike forward and back and lube it in that way. So that's a bit of a nuisance. So what's the bobber like on faster roads and dual carriageways, motorways, and so on? Well, let's have a look. So here we are on a dual carriageway, doing 70 miles an hour. A speed that the bobber can handle, no problem whatsoever. Of course, it is a naked machine, so it offers nothing in the way of wind protection. And with your feet out front and your legs splayed relatively wide apart, you do get a right old uh, draft on the legs. It's not a problem though, you get used to it. I think any faster though, if you're on uh, an autobahn or maybe battling through France to get some distance, it will become fatiguing quite quickly. 60 miles an hour as I'm doing now, you can ride all day long. But uh, anything over 70... Okay, let's just quickly try, there we go. I'm just touching on an indicated 80 now. And it's quite uh, hard to keep hold of the bars. There's a bit of strain on the neck and the portion in front is getting away from me. So yeah, it's not a, it's not a motorway cruiser really. kind of my summary of what it's like to uh, live with the uh, Triumph Bobber on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. So now I've had the bike for a little while and I've, I've had a good uh, uh, time to get to know the bike, what, are the, what do I think are the good and bad points? Because of course no bike is perfect. So let's just start with a few of the bad points that, uh, that I've picked up. Um, there's a number of things. I made a note just to make sure I don't forget anything. First thing and probably the biggest gripe for me is the tank. It's just too small. Um, it, uh, it takes 70 miles until uh, you're looking for a garage, the light comes on at about 70 miles, or rather when you fill it up it just says you've got a range of 70 miles, light comes on when you've got about 20 miles to go, and then I'm in sort of panic mode when the light's on. So this isn't a bike you're going to be touring on unless you like going to fuel stations. So that's the first thing. I understand why Triumph have uh, put a small tank on, it's kind of in keeping with the looks of the bike, but it is a bit of a pain me around about. It's the, I think I've never ridden a bike that's got less of a range, put it that way, so that's a, that's a bad thing. Um, I don't know if uh, that can be addressed in the next version, who knows, but uh, for me, the small tank, right pain in the backside. Um, the other thing is, front brake, mentioned it before, um, it's just the single disc and it's not great on stopping power. You really have to give the front brake a really good yank to get the thing to stop. Um, and I've been using the back brake a lot more than I would normally on a bike, so back brake and front brake pretty much all the time with this. Uh, it's just not quite as good a front brake as I'd like on a bike like this. It, when I ride my other bikes and then go on this, it always catches me out the first time we use it, the brakes just kind of aren't there, so that's definitely a bad point. A um, couple of smaller things, um, there's, they've done a great job, uh, Triumph, of hiding all the cables and pipes and things like that, but uh, on the handlebars, they've hidden the cables underneath some sort of rubber bands up here. Um, and they've done, it's quite a neat job, but the rubber bands are black. Um, again, tiny point, but if they were maybe just in silver or grey, that would probably just work a little bit better, so that's a very small point. Just looks a bit tacky when you're looking at them all the time, I think. Um, the other thing is, like all bikes, really does need a tail tidy. The back end of this thing is absolutely hideous looking. Um, I'm sure aftermarket um, tail tires will be available. I'm not sure, maybe even Triumph make one, but uh, certainly the back needs something doing to get rid of those lights and, uh, and the big number plate. Um, uh, the other thing that I've found with it is, uh, and this is something that's peculiar to me because I like to clean my bikes a lot, I like them looking spangly. This has got to be, I think it takes the record for me now as being the worst bike I know to clean. Previously the record had been held by my GS, it's got lots of nooks and crannies. This thing, I think it's even worse. There's so many little bits where water hides, you definitely need a dryer to get at them properly. Um, there's a lot of um, sort of scaffolding like bar work, cable work in the frame. It's a real pain to clean. That plus the spokes as well, just makes it uh, you know, a bit of a nuisance if you're a cleaning freak like I am. So, so it may not be important to you, but it's important to me. Uh, and then last but not least, um, and again, this is a, quite a big deal. I've noticed there's some tarnishing on the engine cases already, particularly if I bring the camera forward and give you another shot in a moment. On the engine cases here, you can, um, you can just see some little spots of corrosion starting to uh, take a hold, which for a bike 
this one's you know six months old or less uh, I just think isn't good uh, I noticed something similar I think it was on the T100 that I borrowed so I think there might just be a bit of an issue although the fit and finish on the bike is lovely long term it's going to be interesting to see if there's a corrosion issue with these uh, with these aluminium cases so that's it for the bad stuff what about the good stuff well, don't let me mislead you because there's absolutely loads of good stuff about this bike, of course. Uh, if you saw my uh, top five things I love about the Bobber, you'll know about most of them anyway. But uh, things like the, just the way the bike looks, I think it's super cool. I know it's a factory custom. I know that's not cool in some people's eyes. But to me, the thing just looks right. It's really, really nice. The acceleration is amazing. It's one of those bikes that uh, from sort of 0 to 70, you really have to hold on. If you wind her on, the thing just flies. And that's a company with such a lovely sound out of these big old pipes as well. Absolutely lovely. So despite all those uh, little niggles that I talked about, if you said to me, would I have one of these? Well, absolutely, yes, I would. This, I think, is possibly my favourite Bonneville yet. Oh, don't forget, of course, the handling. The handling on this is just amazing. For a bike that looks like this, it just goes around corners much, much better than, than it should do. So for me, out of all the new Bonnevilles that I've ridden so far, and I think I've ridden them all except probably the Scrambler so far, this is definitely the best all-rounder. It's, it's quite close with the T100, which I love, but I think this one may have stolen my heart even more. OK, so I uh, hope that's of interest to you. Look forward to speaking to you next time. Until then, this has been the Missenden Flyer. Cheerio. Ah, fuel light's on again.